All the best. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you. This is the first prophecy conference. I've been invited to many prophecy conferences, but this is the first one that I was allowed to talk about prophecy. <laughs> Every prophecy conference, they say, please, none of that discussion about Islam and the Bible, just your testimony. Because in the West, we still hung up in our old outmoded interpretations. Looking at the Bible as it's a Western manual, it's a Western manuscript. So in the West, they kind of look at the allegory as literal and the literal as allegory. So the seven mountains are in Vatican, yet there are other seven mountains in the world. You got seven mountains in Mecca, you got seven mountains in Istanbul, you got seven mountains in San Francisco. I mean, why can't it be San Francisco? Why are we picking on the Catholics? Now, we're going to have a long, long study. I am not an exciting teacher. <laughs> We're going to get technical because you study the Bible. Just as you study algebra, you don't preach algebra. It'd be a big problem if we preached algebra. I will give you a little background about myself. Uh, I come from both specters of this world. My mother was an American who met my father, who's an Arab, Jordanian, in Humble State College University today. My American side, my great-grandfather was mayor of Eureka, California. He was also an excellent friend with Winston Churchill. From my Arabic side, my grandfather was the chieftain, Mukhtar, and he owned a big portion of the shepherd's fields, you know, where the angel came down and proclaimed the Messiah? That was owned by grandpa, most of it. And he was also friends with the notorious Hajj Amin al Husseini, who was the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, the Supreme Muslim Council. And he was seen on the eve of the final solution with Adolf Hitler conspiring to destroy the Jews all throughout the Muslim world. I call him the Haman of the Muslim world. He constructed two divisions out of the eight divisions of the Nazi war machine. Most Americans do not know that two divisions out of the eight divisions of the Nazi war machine were Muslim fundamentalists. Most Americans think that Islamic fundamentalism is something new. It is not. It's very old. Most Americans do not even identify what Islamic fundamentalism is or what is Islam. I'm going to identify Islamic fundamentalism for you, so when you see it happen, and you watch the footage on the TV or you listen to stuff on the radio, that everything is going to fit the mold of this definition I'm about to give you. But I want you to memorize it. Here it goes. Islamic fundamentalism is a cult-like process that indoctrinates masses in unison in order to convert them to become seekers of salvation by death in order to establish an Islamic theocracy where Sharia law takes over the entire laws of the society in which Islam and Muslims are dominant and non-Muslims are subservient. This dogma will take the life of the recruiter and the recruitee in every aspect of their life in which they always long to the glory days when Islam was triumphant and when Islam ruled the ancient world. There's simply a needle that's stuck in the past. Islam was wounded by the Christians when the Ottoman Empire was dismantled. And what is being attempted to happen now is that this wound must be healed. It must come back to life and Islam must be revived. 
This is what you see happening around you. Yet in the West, there is this facade of denial of what is going on. When I first started to read the Bible, I was fascinated with the minor prophets. I began to see very quickly that the good guys that I knew were the good guys were the bad guys in the Bible. And the bad guys in the Bible were my good guys. Something was very fishy. I began to see that my Mahdi was your Antichrist. And your Christ was my Antichrist. In fact, Muhammad said that one of the signs of the times for Muslims is that the false Christ will lead 70,000 Jews and Christians from Jerusalem. Satan even knew that there will be a unity between Christians and Jews in the ends of time. And one of the signs that we know the Mahdi is coming is that the Mahdi will bring a seven-year peace upon the earth. Yet when I read the book of Daniel, I was crushed to find out that my Mahdi was your Antichrist. <laughs> Something indeed was very fishy. I began to begin to understand that Satan was extremely clever. That if you want to understand prophecy, you must pick on the brains of Satan because he knows it. He knew it all along for thousands of years. So he set up Islamic eschatology to match your eschatology, except he flipped who the good guy is to become the bad guy, the bad guy, the good guy. We have just completed the 2007 International Prophecy Conference with nearly a dozen world-renowned speakers, but you don't have to miss a minute. I've been invited to many prophecy conferences, but this is the first one that I was allowed to talk about prophecy. Could the apparitions that perform numerous signs and wonders that the Catholic Christians revere and worship also be the same things that Muslims will also worship? Our spiritual link is so connected to Israel that whatever God promised Israel as a blessing can come upon us as Gentiles. By 2015, Muslims will make up a majority of the Russian army. Get the entire conference today. All messages on audio tape or CD for only $119 plus $10 shipping. Or on DVD for only $199 plus $10 shipping. When you order all the sessions, we will send you absolutely free the historic convocation where eight speakers were together on one panel for three exciting hours. Call now, toll free, 1-888-463-7639 and have your credit card ready. All my life as a teenager, I grew up in the Middle East. In the Palestinian areas, of course. My desire was to die as a martyr. Because the only way one can assure one's own salvation in Islam is to die as a martyr. Most Muslims will tell you that they reject Christianity because no one can die for somebody else's sin. That the idea of a Messiah dying on the cross to redeem mankind's sin is absolutely rejected in Islam. There is no atonement for sin by anybody in Islam. This is the main focus that Islam came as a religion was to supposedly correct the Jews and the Christians, specifically the Christians, because the Christians believe in the Trinity and they believe God is our father. They believe God came in the flesh. They believe that Jesus died on the cross. All these things are denied in Islam. Islam came as a religion for one sole purpose and one reason alone. That is to deny Abba, our father, to deny the son, to deny the Holy Spirit being God, to deny the Trinity, and to deny the crucifixion of Jesus. Of course, that should pop up an important verse for you. 1 John 2.22 Who is the liar? He who denies that Jesus is the Christ, that God came in the flesh, 
He is Antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. When I read this as a Muslim, something is more fishy. <laughs> something is definitely wrong here. How could it be that I would accept these very elements that I hated all my life? The Trinity? I began to see that God was indeed complex. And the Bible talks about a complex God that we cannot dissect, while us as Muslim, we're talking about a God that we simplify and dissect so easily. So Satan made things very simplistic, and it became palatable for the Muslims. I began to see the angel of light that the Bible talks about. Then I started to ask questions. How is it that Islam as a religion rejects the idea of atonement, that somebody could die for somebody, yet at the same time, when my cousin Ra'id tried to plant a bomb in Ben Yehuda Street in Jerusalem and was killed by the Israelis. The Israelis shoot first when they know you have explosives. They shoot first and they ask questions later. They don't take chances. He was killed, and my Aunt Fatima had a wedding celebration for her son, because now my cousin Ra'id is in heaven. What is he doing in heaven? First thing he does is that his sins will be forgiven at the first drop of his blood. The first drop that falls from the, quote, martyr's blood is shed, his sins are forgiven. Something is ringing a bell in my Christian friends' minds. And he intercedes for 70 members of his own family so they can go to paradise. How is it that Islam rejects intercession but only accepts intercession when somebody is martyred so they can assure themselves that they go to paradise? There is no assurance for in Islam for believers and followers to go to heaven. Satan capitalized on the basic need of humanity to want to go to heaven. He capitalized so well on it and he hated humanity so much that he wanted the destruction of humanity. And that was a great idea to have us kill ourselves and kill each other so we can supposedly go to his paradise which is hell. I began to ask myself many questions because I remember as a child growing up in the Middle East, we were in Jericho. My father was stationed teaching school in Jericho and in Jericho, I remember going to kindergarten and we were singing a song as kids, you know, in unison, which means Arabs are beloved and Jews are dogs. Did not know what a Jew was. However, my mother who was an American, she was not permitted for 35 years to go back to her country in America. She was held captive by my father. This is why I like to warn the ladies. You got daughters? Make sure they don't marry a Muslim. Is that racism? No. Because in 55 Muslim states, not one Muslim country is signatory to the Hague Convention. Which means if your daughter or your granddaughter or yourself, marry a Muslim and your husband decides to keep you, there's nothing your country can do for you. It also means, God forbid, you have a daughter from that marriage. That Muslim woman must marry a Muslim male. If she doesn't, she is to be killed by a member of the family. Honor killing doesn't also include, doesn't only uh, in include women, but it also includes men who leave the faith of Islam. Islam as a religion does not honor women's rights. It does not honor whatever women desire. I am trying to get those Christian antennas in your head to go up automatically without me pushing the button. Who else does not honor the desire of women? The Antichrist as well, he attempts to change 
times and laws. I think I mentioned to you that Islam's main mission is to establish Sharia law throughout the whole world. To change all the laws of the world to that religious law which ordains that if people leave the faith, they are to be beheaded. When you look at the book of Revelation, and I knew that before even I became a Christian as I was studying, I knew what it would take for me to make that leap of faith to become a Christian. When I started to read and I saw the martyrs who were beheaded in the name of Jesus, I began to understand the price that one could pay for believing in Christ. Do you think that the words in the book of Revelation that God was kind of kidding? He was not kidding. I began to ask myself many questions. That we tried all our lives to destroy that little state called Israel. And right there in the six day war, I was there. Israel won in six days. Why? Because in the book of Joshua, it talks about a six day war. It says on the seventh day, early in the morning. The seventh day didn't even begin. The children of Israel arose and went around the walls of Jericho seven times and kaboom, boom, 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 done. Right? You know the story. Joshua had a six day war. And here I was living another war called the six day war that was unfolding in front of our eyes. We opened the doors when the six days were over on the seventh day early in the morning to see Israeli tanks rolling in Jericho. And I question and answer time, dad, that's not the flag that I saluted all the time that's on the tanks. That's a star, blue star. What is that about? We lost the war. How could it be? We were all marching. Everybody was marching all throughout the Middle East. We're going to destroy the Jews. It is a pushover. Goliath will kill David. But we were shocked. David killed Goliath. It would never have been a miracle if Goliath killed David. But God ordained it that the boy kills the giant. Why? Because if it's not so, where's the miracle? I began to understand that all my life as I grew up, I've entered into this experience that even Moses would desire to have witnessed. All of you remember those days. All of you almost have lived the times that God who's brought the children of Israel not just out of Egypt, but out of the land of the north and out of all the countries where he has driven them. From 100 different countries, God's bringing Jews back to the land of Israel and the world is in denial of what's going on. Even Moses would be dancing in joy because he had a hard time to bring them out of one country, Egypt. God exists. His message is one. I began to understand his book is one. And his nation is one. And his faith is one. And his Messiah is one. We believe in one God. God exists. His message is one. I began to understand his book is one. And his nation is one. And his faith is one. And his Messiah is one. We believe in one God. He brought the children of Israel. In fact, in Amos chapter 9 verse 15, he says, I will plant them in their land and no longer shall they be pulled out of that land. How is it possible that we failed six day war the war of Yom Kippur, 1948, 
and all the terrorist activity that we did, we could not destroy that little nation called Israel. For I am God and there is no other. I am God, there is none like me, for telling the end from the beginning. He had thousands of these declarations in this manuscript that I began to unravel in 1993 in my attempt to convert my poor wife to Islam. Where are the corruptions you are talking about in the Bible, of course? I had thought sincerely that when I did my prayer asking the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to show me the truth, I had the Quran and the Bible side by side comparing both manuscripts. And I wanted to ask God for help. And I wanted a neutral prayer that both Muslims, Jews, and Christians will agree to since I want to make sure that I'm addressing God in the proper fashion. So I said the most neutral prayer will be in the name of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Muslims believe in Abraham, supposedly, and Jacob, supposedly, and they believe in God. And Jews and Christians will agree. So I said in the name of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Show me the truth. I suspect the Quran is better than the Bible. But you show me the truth. And if you show me the truth, I will do your will in my life. I will do anything you want. Anything. I will go to the end of the world. You just show me your truth. You know what happens when you pray in the name of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Here's what happens. You dialed the right number. You dial the right number. Somebody on the other side picks up. I've been calling you all this time. How come you never answered? Well, you've been dialing the wrong number. I began to read that in every context in the Bible where Jesus is present, where God is present on the earth, and nations are being mentioned in which he will fight, every single one of them is Muslim. Every single one. I began to look at Psalm chapter 83. But Psalm 82, verse 8, it says, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all nations. The Lord himself will arise from his throne for that specific incident to judge the following nations. It's the most amazing piece of prophecy in the Bible. Yet when I became a believer and walked into a church, no one ever knew about the stuff that I was talking about. We were studying the book of Acts every single month and never got to these things that's in the Bible regarding these prophetic things. God will arise to judge the nations and then he mentions them one by one. They have said, come and let us cut them off from becoming a nation that the name of Israel be remembered no more. For they form a confederacy against you, the tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites. Who are these people? Muslim. And I began to read, Assyria came to their aid. Do to them as you did to Zeb and Zalmuna. Who is Zeb and Zalmuna? Zeba and Zalmuna, verse 11. I hope you brought your Bibles with you. The American mindset would look at Zeba and Zalmuna would skip. We don't know who that is and they keep going on. In other words, in other words, what will happen to these people is exactly what happened to Zibah and Zalmuna. And what happened to Zibah and Zalmuna? It's in the book of Judges, chapter 8. I believe verse 26. With the story of Gideon. You've heard of the story of Gideon? 
Now, who is Gideon? How much of the Bible is prophetic? All of it. All of it. Come on, Waleed. All the Bible is prophetic? Yes. Okay, I can give you a verse that is not prophetic. Let's see. Uh, Blessed are you when they persecute you. Jesus given a sermon. How is that prophetic? Sure is. Because he was leaving and the sheep are going to become shish kebabs. So he told them, blessed are you when they persecute you. He's leaving. What's going to happen to the believers down there? They're going to get persecuted. That was very prophetic. Joseph, the suffering Messiah. David, the king Messiah. Gideon, Gideon, the brave one. The warring Messiah, the conquering Messiah. You want to know what the Messiah does when he comes back again? Study the book of Gideon. The, the, all, all these things about Gideon, judges. Study Gideon, and you know everything about Gideon, you know what the Messiah is going to do. What he's going to do uh, in verse 21. So Ziba and Zalmuna said, rise yourself and kill us, for as a man is, so is his strength. So Gideon arose and killed Ziba and Zalmuna and took the crescent ornaments that were on their camel's necks. So in other words, when the Messiah comes, he will remove the crescent moon from all over the land on the high places. The crescent moon is on all the minarets, all throughout the Middle East. It must be the highest position in every single village or city is the crescent moon. We have just completed the 2007 International Prophecy Conference with nearly a dozen world-renowned speakers, but you don't have to miss a minute. I've been invited to many prophecy conferences, but this is the first one that I was allowed to talk about prophecy. Could the apparitions that perform numerous signs and wonders that the Catholic Christians revere and worship also be the same things that Muslims will also worship? Our spiritual link is so connected to Israel that whatever God promised Israel as a blessing can come upon us as Gentiles. By 2015, Muslims will make up a majority of the Russian army. Get the entire conference today. All messages on audio tape or CD for only $119 plus $10 shipping. Or on DVD for only $199 plus $10 shipping. When you order all the sessions, we will send you absolutely free the historic convocation where eight speakers were together on one panel for three exciting hours. Call now, toll free, 1-888-463-7639 and have your credit card ready. In 45 of Isaiah chapter 23, the second half, that to me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath. There it is. Every knee will bow, every tongue shall take an oath. All right? He shall say, surely the Lord have righteousness and strength. To him men shall come. Oh, the Lord is here and the whole world is flocking to worship the Lord. Who bows to him? Every knee will bow. Not just human beings will bow. Look at 46, the first verse. Bell bows, Nebo stoops. Arthur Jeffrey, one of the greatest historians in Islam, says that the worship of Allah is the same as worship of Bell, the moon god. Allah is another form of the worship of Bell. Before the advent of Islam, they worshiped the moon god. Bell is the moon god. And it says, bell bows. The moon god will bow, the crescent moon. Nebo stoops, their idols were on the beasts and on the cattle. Remember, I was sharing with you judges. It was on the camel's necks, the crescent moon that was plucked away. That also will bow. And it goes on to talk about this amazing prophetic stuff. It will really literally take me, uh, let's say, eight hours a day for a month to go over the things that I've discovered. But I only have two hours. How can I share all these things in two hours? Unfortunately, in America, everything is fast food. Quickly. Get this guy out of the stage. There's another guy who's coming after. I began to understand even from understanding the Bible about the concept of who Satan is. The Quran, we memorize big portions of the Quran as Muslims. What is the definition of 
our God in Islam. How does it differ from the definition of God in the Bible? It goes further than my Antichrist was your Christ and your Antichrist was my Christ. The 99 names of Allah in the Quran. Allah has 99 names. Some of the names of Allah in the Quran will be shocking to a Christian. One of the names of Allah in the Quran is Al Mutakabbir, which means the most proud one. And ten others are going, ee, 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 ee. they're going up a little further. I can see them. Invisible antennas. The other name is Adar, the one who causes affliction or the afflictor. Who's the one who causes affliction? Al Mumit, the one who causes death. I said them in Arabic, so this way they recorded. You can go and interpret it and make sure that I ain't lying or making things up. Another name for Allah is Al-Makir, the great deceiver. They plot and Allah plotteth and Allah is the greatest of all plotters. So all these things they accuse Americans of conspiracy theories and the Zionists of conspiracies, the international Zionist conspiracies this and conspiracies that, when the only one who's conspiring is the Muslim fundamentalists themselves. The funerals become weddings in which the martyr now is bewed to virgins. Everything is in reverse. Death becomes life. Life becomes death, Satan becomes God, and God becomes Satan, and they don't even know what in the world they're dealing with. If I can teach Americans of how clever Satan is, and I can plant the filter necessary in the youth mind of a Christian youth, he will go to university all his life, he will know as soon as he sees stuff where it came from. Antennas will be ee, nice and fresh and good and be able to like a radar pick up the stuff Because I came out of that stuff. I feel many times like Captain Spock <laughs> I gotta tell Captain Kirk how the aliens are thinking <laughs> The Quran says about Allah الله نور السماوات والأرض مثل نوره كمصباح المصباح في زجاجة الزجاجة كأنها كوكب دري. Let me translate that for you, my American friends. Allah is the light of the earth and the heavens. He's a light being. مثل نوره كمصباح. The likeness of his brightness and his light is as a torch or as a lamp. Now, and it goes on to say, al masbah fi zujaja, it is in a glass thing, and then al zujaja tu kana kaukab dunri. That light being is like a floating star. Okay, so it's light being, and it's like a star. And I don't know. It seems that the antennas are stalled here, but I need to kind of raise them up a little further, and. Revelation chapter 8 verse 10 Remember what I said he's a, as a torch as a light In verse 10 then third an angel sounded and a great star fell from heaven burning like a torch And it fell on the third of the rivers and on the springs of water the name of it was wormwood And then chapter 9 I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth to him you see the star is not a star literally it's an allegory to him the star was given the key to the bottomless pit and what is it this this angel of death is released in the, the Hebrew his name is Abaddon in the Greek is Apollyon which means destruction right what does terrorism mean after all destruction how do you fight terrorism Terrorism equals fear. 
the way you fight fear is what? Fearlessness. You can't fight fear with fear. We need to raise a generation of Christians that are fearless. That are willing to die. That are not afraid to die. That are afraid, not afraid to be martyred for the cause of Christ. But unfortunately, fear works in the West. Some of the verses about Allah and the Quran. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ I seek refuge from the Lord of the dawn. The dawn, you know the dawn, the morning star. مِنْ شَرِّ مَا خَلَقِ I seek refuge from him, from the evil he hath created. How is it that somebody seeks refuge from Allah who creates evil? And I seek refuge from him to protect me from the evil that he unleashes. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ مَلِكِ النَّاسِ Say, I seek refuge from the Lord of the multitudes. إِلَاهِ النَّاسِ the the Lord, Malik Nas, the king of the multitudes. Min sharril waswas al khannas. For I seek refuge from him from the evil also. He is also called Malik al Nasi wal jinn, insi wal jinn. He is the king of the multitudes and the demons. The word multitudes comes in the Bible. Because Islam, as a religion, is a multitude of nations from different tongues, languages, and backgrounds who follows one man, and that is Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam. But who is Muhammad in accordance to the Quran and Islamic teaching? Muhammad is the perfect Adam. He's not some mere prophet, as Muslims claim. He is the perfect Adam. He is better than Adam. He is better than Jesus. It's a very messianic attributes that is given to this man Muhammad in which in the ends of times his spirit will come again in the form of the Mahdi. In other words, this Messiah must come again. Most Americans don't understand that when the Bible says the Antichrist, they think that when the Antichrist comes, he will say, uh, look guys, gals, I'm Jesus. I died for your sins. Here's the marks on my hands and my feet. But in reality, he was not the real one. And I died for you. I, I shed my blood for you. No! He's not going to mention the blood. He hates it. He is anti, anti, anti-Christ. And he also replaces Christ. Both. He's against and he is a replacement. Islam as a religion is the most anti-Christ religion that there is. Hindus don't care about the Trinity, Son, the Father. All the other cults don't care as much as Islam cares about Father and all these things. So the Catholics cannot be accused of being anti-Christ. They can't because, you know, do you ever see a Catholic pray? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Splash, splash, splash. Thank you, thank you. you know? I mean, they emphasize on it so much. The Father, and the Son, and, and we disagree with them, and all these things. But they cannot be the harlot of Babylon. It's impossible. The harlot of Babylon cannot be the Catholic Church. Rome is mentioned 15 times in the Bible. How many times does the Bible mention Roman destruction? How many times? Literally. Zippo. Not once. Spain is mentioned twice. How many times in destruction? Zippo. Let me ask you a question. Out of all the countries that are mentioned in the Bible literally, literally by name, Name me one country in the Bible that is mentioned by name that is that God destroys in the end that is not Muslim. The different names that God attributes to the Antichrist. What is Antichrist called in the Bible? 
He is called the Assyrian. He is called the Prince of Tyre. Where is Assyria today? Muslim. Prince of Tyre, Lebanon. Where, where is it today? It used to be Christians a few years ago. What happened to Tyre now? It's Muslim. Welcome, Americans, to jihad. <laughs> he is called also Pharaoh of Egypt. Egypt today is what? Muslim. And in every reference where Christ is fighting, that country is Muslim. How come Americans thought for all these years that Christ is going to fight the Antichrist who comes out of Italy and he enjoys eating numero uno pizza <laughs> and spaghetti and meatballs, I guess. I don't know. The EU, one country, ten nations join. Greece was the tenth nation that joined. And then 11 joined, 12 joined, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. And Right, there you go. And I never knew this guy. And I've discovered him later on. I was like, how come he stole my stuff? <laughs> and he, he probably thought the same thing. Who's this guy stealing my stuff? <laughs> well, both our stuffs were coming from the same source at the same time. He was doing his research in 92, and I was doing my research in 92, and he was doing his research in 92, and nobody wanted us to open our mouths at any prophecy conference, so we had to get together and form a gang, and here we are. <laughs> Tell me that Israel doesn't matter. Tell me it doesn't matter. Well, let's see. Judgment Day comes. I'm pro-Palestinian Christian. And I wanted an establishment of a city of Jerusalem to be divided between Muslim Jews and Christians and Arabs and Jews. Let's divide it. Give the eastern portion to the Arabs. It's okay. After all, we'll have peace. But I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus and Him crucified. And I attribute to that kind of thing. And when Christ comes, and He will come, and come He will... He's going to be ticked off. And what is he going to be ticked off about? He tells you, Joel chapter 3. I will gather all nations into the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter into judgment there with them. On the account of my people, my heritage, Israel. Whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. And Westerners don't even know why Christ is going to come. I asked them, why do you think Christ is going to come? Judge said, well, we know that. What's he going to do? Well, bring peace. We know that. What else is he going to do? He's going to come and fight for Jerusalem. And judgment day comes and you're going to go, uh, hi, Jesus. Uh, I'm judging the world. Excuse me, I'm busy right now. I'm going to judge the world for dividing the land of Israel. Well, I'm pro the division of the land of Israel. Left. Next. <laughs> Can one be on the side? I mean, look, who wants to divide Jerusalem? Who wants to divide Jerusalem? The devil! Antichrist wants to divide Jerusalem. What does he come to do? Divide Jerusalem, divide Israel, divide the land. If, if, if Antichrist wants to divide the land, and you are pro the division of the land, what side are you on? He said, I send you a sheep amongst wolves. I send you a sheep amongst wolves. So what does that mean? If you got no wolves, maybe you're not sheep. Think about it. Think about it. If you don't have wolves in your lives, and don't tell me your mother-in-law is the wolf. No. <laughs> that is not what the Bible is talking about. Or your credit problems. Or your hemorrhoids. That's not what God is talking about. <laughs> Those are not the wolves. Wolves are real people who really want to kill you and get you and destroy you for what you believe in. I began to understand when Jesus said that the day will come 
that the ones who will come to kill you, they will be thinking they are doing God a service. In fact, in Psalm 83, clearly what it says, let's go back to Psalm 83. Oh, let's finish this one. Remind me to go back to Psalm 83. Look at that. Verse 8, for it is the day of the Lord's vengeance, the year of recompense for the cause of Zion. What does he do to Arabia? Verse 9, its streams shall be turned into pitch. The word streams, Hebrew is nachal, which, doesn't, which really doesn't mean water streams like you think. It's not water streams. Nachal is torrents, mines. Look it up in the Strongs. Underwater, underground torrents or mines or tunnels will be filled with what? Pitch. What's pitch? You want to argue with that one? Be filled with pitch and its dust into brimstone. Its land shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched night or day. Its smoke shall ascend forever. From generation to generation, it shall lie waste. Al Gore is not going to be happy when this happens. Figure that one out, Gore. Go figure that one out. He's going to complain. He loves to complain. We say, sorry, we're ambassadors for Christ, you know, sitting in our desks and our offices. Sorry, you got to take this with the boss over there in Jerusalem. But we don't really suggest, Al, that you go to Jerusalem and confront with the boss, okay? <laughs> He's not the kind of teddy bear that you thought about him in his first coming. The environmentalists... They can't do anything about it. It's going to burn forever, continually. They're not going to cap these ones. And there you have it. In Psalm 83, it talks about, and that's what really got me, you know, and I read that part. Look at this part here. It says about the Muslims, the Ishmaelites, the Hajarites, they're coming against Israel and God will destroy them. Verse 17, let them be confounded and dismayed forever. Yes, let them be put to shame and perish. Verse 18, that they may know, the Muslims, those are Muslim countries, that they may know that you whose name alone is the Lord are the most high over all the earth. That the Muslims will finally recognize who God is, his name. And what is in a name? You talk to a Western mindset and you say, what's the name of the Lord? Can you tell me? Give me some examples. Come on, talk to me. What? Can you raise your hand? When everybody mats together, you know, we're all sheep. We mat together, doesn't... I want one sheep at a time. Yes. He's going to what? His name is Jehovah. What else? Lamb of God. What else? I am. But what do this mean? Lamb of God. What does it mean? You know, let's think about the word name. The way when you see name, when I see name, I got a different image in my mind than yours. His name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's not a name. Jesus is not from Mexico. His name is not Emmanuel. His name is Yeshua. So name doesn't mean really as you think, name, Paul, John. His name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's, so the Muslims will recognize that God came in the flesh and died for the sins of mankind. They will understand the definition and the attributes of God, finally, in the end. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, what this prophecy is saying is that his name shall be called Counselor. While the world denies it, no one in the world can deny only one person had these titles. You can deny he's God. You can deny he's the Messiah. You can deny he's the Son of God. But there's one thing no one can deny is that his name was called these things. So what is a mountain? Kingdom. So when Christ says, if you have faith of a mustard seed, you can move the mountain, right? 
See, Western mindset things, when Jesus says that, I'll take a little wand with a little star in the end, and I'll stand at the edge and say, move mountain, move. When was the last time you've moved mountains that way? Jesus makes sense. When he says stuff, it means something that makes sense. He really is a great communicator, but he likes to speak in a certain wavelength that few will get. They asked him, how come you speak in parables? He said, so the damn don't get it. Sounds cruel? That's your problem. But that's how he speaks. So the mountain is always a kingdom. The mountains will bow to you. Every hill will bow. Kingdoms will bow. Right? Now, that you know that mountain means kingdom, guess what? You all graduate as experts in Bible prophecy. You're laughing, but I'm not because I'm very serious. I saw the woman, she was drunk of the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs. Right? Okay. Look what it says in verse 9. He tells him in verse 7, don't worry, I'll tell you what the mystery is. In verse 9, here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Now, you saw this image, how all of it is together, God destroys them. Seven mountains. What's a mountain? There are seven heads. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Not very good looking mountains, but seven mountains, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There are also seven heads, right? There are also what? Seven kings. Verse 10. Ah, kings rule what? Kingdom. So a mountain is what? Kingdom. It's not the Vatican. That's not Rome. Five have fallen. One is and the other has not yet come. Hello? Who's talking here? Who's talking? Who's writing this stuff? Thank you. John. He says five kingdoms fell. Where's John sitting? Which number? Number six. John is right here. And what kingdom was John under? Rome. What was before Rome? Greece. What was before Greece? Medo-Persia. There you go with Iran again. And what was before that? Babylon, Iraq. What's going on there? Mess. Same as the statue. What was before that? Assyria. Same stuff like Babylon. Included Turkey. Included Syria and Iraq and all that region. All of them are Muslim. And what was before that? Egypt. Today is what? Muslim. The Lord comes in a swift cloud to fight Egypt. Isaiah 19. All the stuff in the literal applies perfectly. Americans, when they read prophecy, they go to the book of Revelation first. What they need to do is go to the prophets first in Isaiah. One by one, now you apply the literal to the allegoric mold and they must match perfectly. You don't go to Revelation and take, make Revelation. Let's see, but the Bible here is talking about, let's see, Revelation, the bear, that's Russia. Let's make that one Russia. And let's make that one communism. And let's make that one whatever we want. That's why there's so much interpretation out there. So that's the seven heads. They are all at the same time. The woman rules from the desert with her false religion. It's a city that rules this all of them, everything, all the harlotry towards these nations is coming from the desert. Now, the woman has a cup of wine in her hand. And the kings of the earth are drunk from this wine. It has this in abundance. Okay? The abundance of her delicacies. And the earth is drunk and the wax rich. As a result, something ringing a bell in your antennas? It's both. And that oil causes also the blood of the saints to be shed. This is why in Joel 3, when you go to Joel 3, it talks about the judgment, right? When God judges the nations, what do He judge them for? In Joel 3, He tells them. 
Joel 3, I will gather all nations and it, right? We just, we just expressed that one. On the account of my people, my heritage, Israel. He judges the world for dividing Israel and mistreating the, the Jewish people. Look what it says. Verse 3, they have cast lots for my people. Have given a boy as payment for a what? Harlot. What's the woman riding the beast? She's what? Harlot. She's the harlot of Babylon, the prostitute. And sold the girl for what? Wine. The prostitute and the wine is in the same verse in Joel chapter 3. And then he goes on verse 4. Indeed, what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon? Lebanon, Hezbollah. Christ is on earth talking to Hezbollah saying, Who are you to mess with me? Do you think you stand a chance? That's what he's saying. And all the coasts of Philistia, Gaza, Hamas, Hamas, Hezbollah, you want to mess with me? That's what he's saying. What religion are they? Muslim. What countries are those? Muslim. You Americans created us Hamasistan over there by your Oslo Peace Accord. Thanks, but no thanks. All the kings of the earth commit harlotry with who? Are they committing harlotry with the Pope? No. Who's saying Islam is a peaceful religion? We're sorry. Even the Pope. He goes to make men's in Turkey. Sorry. You tell me what that's all about. By peace, he will deceive many. Who's telling you that Islam is a peaceful religion? All over the place. That's all they talk about. Islam is a peaceful religion. Islam was hijacked. I turn on the TV, 9-11. There were planes that were hijacked. And by the time it was all over, the officials and the politicians told us that it was Islam that was hijacked. I'm confused. Which one was hijacked? The jumbo jets or Islam? And if somebody hijacked Islam, what was the ransom? If there is a ransom, guess what? I ain't paid it. Let them hijack it. The confusion that you're living under. Everybody's believing everything's hunky-dory. Verse 17 in uh, Joel 3, even so you shall know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Verse 19, Egypt shall be a desolation and Edom a desolate wilderness because of violence against the people of Judah. Muslim, Muslim, Muslim. Look at verse 21. For I will acquit them from the guilt of the bloodshed whom I had not acquitted for the Lord dwells in Zion. Verse 16, the Lord also will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth will shake at his presence. And this country he's fighting in every single context, every single place where Christ fights. And it's very clear that God is on earth. The nations are Muslim. Here's the confusion. Wait a minute, Walid. We have a problem. Because... The feet are iron, and that's the Roman Empire. Well, yes, it's the Roman Empire. But what part of the Roman Empire is the Bible talking about? So the question is, the coming entity that is going to come and wreak havoc on the earth, is it a revival of an Egyptian empire? Yes. Yes. Not no. Is it the revival of an Assyrian Empire? Yes. Is it the revival of the Babylonian Empire? Yes. Is it the revival of the Persian Empire? Yes. Grecian? Yes. Roman? Yes. Now, we got to the sixth Rome, right? Who's the seventh? Yes. <laughs> Who is the seventh? Five have fallen. Look at that. In chapter 17 of Revelation, there are also seven kings. Five have fallen, verse 10. One is, the other has not yet come. Ah, there's a number seven here. Who's number seven? You remember we talked about the star? 
you know, Satan is as a star that fell from heaven, an asteroid. You know, in, in Acts chapter 9, it talks about asteroid worship. What is the black stone? An asteroid that fell from the skies. And in Acts chapter 19, it talks about to the believers, it says, do not worship Artemis and her image that fell from heaven, from Zeus. And that was an asteroid, literally an asteroid, a black stone that they worshipped in Ephesus in Turkey. Think about this for a minute. How come this has been dropped from the interpretations of prophecy? How come Isaiah 63 is dropped? Isaiah 19 is dropped. Habakkuk 3 is dropped. All the Psalms is talking about all the nations, all the Muslims with the Lord present, all are Muslim, is dropped. What else is there? I mean, every part of the Bible. Do I need to go through Isaiah and Ezekiel and all these things? Even, you know, even Isaiah, 60, uh, Isaiah 13. How much time do we have left? 20 minutes? Mr. Stone's fallen asleep. I better say something more exciting. He says, I know that stuff already. Give me something I do not know. All right. Look at Isaiah chapter 12, verse 6. Cry out and shout, O inhabitants of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in your midst. He is in there. Then he goes in, cha in chapter 13, the burden against Babylon which Isaiah the son of Amos saw. Verse 3, I have commanded my sanctified ones, I have also called my mighty ones for my anger. Those who rejoice in my exaltation. The noise of a multitude in the mountains. You know what mountains mean, right? Like that of many people. A tumultuous noise. The kingdoms together. The Lord of hosts musters his, musters the army for battle. They come from a far country. The Lord and his weapon of indignation to destroy the whole land. By the way, you will be with the Lord fighting in Israel. Did you know that? Joel chapter 2 and 3 is very clear. The stars of heaven will fall and all these things. Now, Isaiah 14. Against the king of Babylon, right? Verse 4. He is nicknamed the king of Babylon who is the Antichrist. Okay? Then go to verse 12. Verse 12. Very interesting. You know what it says? Sorry. Let's go to verse 8. Indeed, the cypress of the trees is over you and the cedars of Lebanon saying, since you were cut down. Verse 9, hell from beneath is excited about you to meet you at your coming. You're going to come again? Sure. You think you're, you think you're Messiah? Yeah, go ahead. Come again. Hell is waiting for you. It's going to suck you up. It stares up the dead for you. Verse 12, how you are fallen from heaven, O Hilal ibn Sahar. You read that, I know you're looking at me funny because you're, you're looking at the word Lucifer. Hilal, Hilal. Go to the Hebrew. Ben Sahar. That's the Hebrew rendering for the word Lucifer that you got here. Very important. Different. Hilal is an Arabic word, Aramaic, Ethiopian, Chaldean. Hilal means brightness and also means crescent moon. Son of the morning, Sahar, the morning star. Now, you know that when the Gideon plucked away the crescent moons from the camel's necks? Remember that verse I shared with you? He plucked what? The Saharon, the crescent, the Sahar, son of the crescent also. The morning star, the whole thing. His nicknames, God loves nicknames. And by the way, most Americans think that here he is talking to the angel Lucifer in his heavenly realm or being. No. He's talking to Antichrist. He's calling him, you're a crescent. 
You don't believe me. Say this is not talking about Antichrist. This is talking about the angel Lucifer. Tell me that. It is about Lucifer, yes. It is about the devil, yes. But it's about the devil meeting the body of Antichrist as he's cast out of heaven as a star rejected down to earth to take over the world. Look what it says. Look at verse... That's right, verse 16. Those who see you will gaze at you. He's captured finally, right? And consider you saying, is this the man who made the earth tremble? When was Lucifer a man? The five eyes, you know, I will and I will and I will and I will. These are the declarations of Antichrist. He will sit on the sides of the north. And there you have it. It's all over. Now you go to the rest of the chapters of Isaiah. You go to chapter 15. It's talking about Moab, Jordan. Chapter 17, the burden against Damascus, Muslim country. Chapter uh, 18, Kush, Ethiopia. By the way, in chapter 18 of Isaiah, Ethiopia, Kush, is not what you think as modern Ethiopia. You got to go to the Bible dictionary. For the word Kush is the landmass south of Egypt. And what is south of Egypt? Sudan, Somaliland, Muslim. Chapter 19. Behold, that's the one I shared with you. The Lord rides on a swift cloud and will come into Egypt. Will come into Egypt. Remember the first one? He's going to destroy Egypt. They all come at the end at the same time. We have just completed the 2007 International Prophecy Conference with nearly a dozen world-renowned speakers, but you don't have to miss a minute. I've been invited to many prophecy conferences, but this is the first one that I was allowed to talk about prophecy. Could the apparitions that perform numerous signs and wonders that the Catholic Christians revere and worship also be the same things that Muslims will also worship? Our spiritual link is so connected to Israel that whatever God promised Israel as a blessing can come upon us as Gentiles. By 2015, Muslims will make up a majority of the Russian army. Get the entire conference today. All messages on audio tape or CD for only $119 plus $10 shipping. Or on DVD for only $199 plus $10 shipping. When you order all the sessions, we will send you absolutely free the historic convocation where eight speakers were together on one panel for three exciting hours. Call now, toll free, 1-888-463-7639 and have your credit card ready. Why does he fight these Muslim nations? He tells you why. Verse 8, for it is the day of the Lord's vengeance, the year of recompense for the cause of what? Zion. And then he destroys the oil, which we shared with you already. Okay? Ezekiel 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33. Takes hours just to go over the stuff when the nations are thrown into the pit, one by one, into the pit, into the pit. Antichrist tries to change times and laws. Who's trying to change all your laws, my American friends? Every country in the Middle East is taken over by Islam. What happens? Secular laws taken out, Islamic laws introduced. The times. What time? What's time? Calendar. Time, time. You can look at all these interpretations as times. Let's see. He changes the cosmos, the planetariums. You're waiting for an Antichrist that ain't coming. He changes the times. Why? Because right now the whole world uses Anno Domini. Satan hates that. He does not like Anno Domini. Look at every single Islamic culture when they change. They change it, take it Anno Domini, and they enter the AH after the Hijra of Muhammad. Muhammad, by the way, the calendar of Islam began not in Mecca. It began when Muhammad immigrated from Mecca to Medina. And that's where the advent of Islam began. In Medina. Why? Because Satan, when he introduced the worship of the moon god, he introduced it in Yathrib, in Medina. When? You know the story of Nebuchadnezzar? His son, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar introduced the worship of the moon god from Babylonia in Arabia. 
That's why it's called in the Bible the daughter of Babylon. Or daughter, being born from Babylon. It is another Babylonian religion. The greatest gods in the Roman Empire was also the crescent moon. In the Grecian. In the Egyptian was the sun and, and the moon. Mayan. All this, the worship of the moon, the symbol of Satan, was prevalent from Babylonia. It's a Babylonian religion. What is this whole thing about being a Babylonian religion? What happened in Babylonia? Let's think for a minute. What happened in Babylonia? What happened? What did Nimrod do? What did this Zugarid all about? Tower of Babel. What happened in the Tower of Babel? What did they say? Let us make a name for ourselves. Let's build a name for ourselves. Build a kingdom, a name. Let's take tar, asphalt, and bricks. And they use tar and bricks to build the Zugarit. What are the Muslims saying today? Let us use oil. We have a few years left. Let us use the oil and build Islam as a name for us all over the world. And they're using the oil. And where is it coming out of? Saudi Arabia again. And they're trying to reverse what God has done in the Bible where he scattered the people and made them different languages. Now you Christians translate the Bible to all these languages, go through all this tedious work. Why don't you just write it in English and unite the world under English because you know that God doesn't want that. God does not want to bring everybody under one language. No Muslim can worship Allah without worshiping Him in Arabic language. Only via the Arabic. That's why Afghans speak Arabic, Iranians speak Arabic. One language. One nation called the nation of Islam, Ummah. One law. One government system for the whole world. You know what are waiting for the one world government? Here it is. Changing the times, the laws, no respect for women. The end justifies the means, there is no respect for borders. And we'll behead you with no problems in front of the internet camera. And the Antichrist honors the God of fortresses or the God of war. Who's honoring the God of fortress? The God of war. Jew? No. Well, wait a minute, the Antichrist is Jew, why? Well. Israel will not sign a peace treaty unless the Antichrist is Jew. Excuse me, they signed a peace treaty with Yasser Arafat. <laughs> and he was no Jew. And he did worship a single God called Allah. Because they say, well, he does not honor the God of his fathers. Some translations have God, it's really Eloha, God's plural. But some translations have it as God of his fathers. And since the Jews only worship the singular God, so the Antichrist must be a Jew. Well, the Muslims worship a singular God too. And he is the God of war, just like the Bible prescribed. Jews don't worship a God of war. Jews say that God is Abba, our Father. They do believe in Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. Yet, they don't believe Jesus is the Messiah, that's true. But they don't fit the bill. Neither the Catholics fit the bill. Only Islam fits the bill perfectly. From all the literals. I had one debate and one scholar on television. I like the guy. He's a friend of mine too. I said, how come every time I ask you to prove to me that Rome is the harlot of Babylon and that Europe is the beast, you are always referring to an allegory. And every time that I want to prove to you that it's not Rome, it's Mecca, it's not Europe, it's the Middle East and the Muslim world, I'm always referring you to a literal. Did you get it? You ask any one of those. What's the evidence? They will always 100% give you an allegory, not a literal. You take those literals from all the Bible, from the beginning to the end, put them down, chart them out, like I said, then you superimpose them on the book of Revelation. The Bible, God, did not forget to tell us about Islam. We forgot to look at what God has been trying to tell us all these years.
And when we Christians, when we Christians complain, we don't like the media. I don't like the media. Why? Because the media has censorship. They don't let the Christians speak up. Let me tell you about Christian censorship. Christians censor more than the secular media censors. They don't want you to know that either. That's the first prophecy conference that I was allowed to confuse you with the facts. Now that you're confused with the facts, there is a blessing and there is a curse. There is a blessing, there is a curse. The blessing is you'll never be the same. You'll never be the same, you're going to tell other people. And the curse is that it's a major burden to know the future. I asked God one day, 